Festival, presented as part as the over, of the overall Kendall Mountain Festival. Um, we're delighted to have Cotswold Outdoor as our official partner this year. Thank you so much for coming. It's 9.15. Um, this is the first 9.15 session that I've ever done that's been sold out, so this is incredible. Um, and we all know it's because of Jet. <laughs> She's on stage. Um, my name's Ibi. Absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Ibi Sykes. I am a cyclist, runner, general outdoor enthusiast, nothing, no, not a slight patch on Christian Lewis here. Um, I'd just like to caveat this talk that I'm coming off the back of a chest infection. Um, I'm going to try and keep my coughing and spluttering to a minimum, but if I stumble over my words, I'm so sorry. Um, it's just that time of the year. Um, so what we will do today is we'll have a chat for about 45 minutes, and then I've left 15 minutes to um, do a Q&A. Um, think of all the questions that you have to ask Christian, um, and then after that, we'll have a book signing, so you can ask even more questions and get all the pictures that you want. Um, I saw so many of you were already pouncing on him as you came in. Um, I am so excited to introduce Christian Lewis. This has been one of my most favourite books that I've read this year. Um, obviously, I'm sure that a lot of you already know who he is, but obviously, Christian Lewis, former paratrooper from Wales, who uh, found himself in 2017, um, a few weeks from homelessness, um, with only a few pounds in his pocket, decided to walk the coast of um, the UK. So, welcome. Thank welcome you. To Thank Mountain you, everybody, Festival. for coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't get this into my head, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to just start by kind of bringing us back to 2017, where you were, what mindset you were in, kind of what really triggered this, um, this journey, and kind of talk us through that? Yeah, so I mean, going right back, it was a, over a good few years that this happened, but, you know, the more I've, the longer I've been away from it, I suppose, and the more time that goes on, do you know, I just felt like a caged animal, I think, that that was what it was like, I, I really found it hard to be part of, um, I suppose there's a saying, isn't there, that some birds weren't supposed to be caged, and that's how I felt. I just felt, no matter what I did in life, what job I did, I was always searching for something different. But I was never, I was always going with this and, and, and never with this. So, um, yeah, it just came to a, an abrupt sort of end where I just knew that, you know, if I don't do something about this, once my daughter had left home, if I don't do something about this, then, you know, where, where's the rest of my life going? Am I just going to be that guy who just floats through life to work? to just be able to afford to live in a house or a flat. You know, it's, it just didn't seem right to me. So, um, yeah, I'd had enough of it. I, I really, really had, and it got me really down. And, um, you know, I think it's very easy to turn around and say that it was, it was depression, but depression is, is such a wide spectrum, if that makes sense. And, and maybe it wasn't. Maybe I just needed to get away and, and actually do something that I liked rather than what everybody else was telling me to do. Did you feel like it was an active decision on your part, or was it just kind of like the culmination of everything that kind of, like, I mean, the journey that you ended up going on, I feel like you, that wasn't necessary, how it turned out wasn't how it was planned to be. So yeah, was there an active part of you that was like, I'm going to walk the coast line, or was it kind of just more, everything came together and it was just, let's go. Oh, it was a complete, I completely winged it. There was no um, plan to anything. It really was. I had no idea what I was going to be doing the next day, you know, from the day that I start, first thought about it. All I knew was that it gave me an excited feeling, uh, yeah. and that was something that I needed to chase. And you but hadn't had that feeling for a while? I hadn't had that feeling. Um, probably the most excited I'd felt since then, obviously, was when my daughter was born, and then, you know, when I got custody of her. But after that, um, you know, my own issues came together, and no, I hadn't felt like that. Um, I don't think I'd felt like that really ever. Awesome. It was a very different thing to having a child, you know, so they're two different emotions. But, um, yeah, I don't think I'd ever had it. Amazing. And in the end, how many miles was it that you ended up doing? Do you know? I don't know exactly. It's, it's never actually been... I mean, so many people say so many different things, but I've really, really worked it out, and I've looked... For example, you know, Shetland's a 1,000 miles. Um, the Outer Hebrid is nearly a 1,000 miles, just Lewis and Harris. So in total, it's something between eighteen and 19,000, which is unbelievable, but... There's a lot of islands and a lot of land and, and a lot of the west coast of Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> and were you, because in the book at some point you said that you're one of the first to kind of actually do a lot of the, the islands and go around. Yeah, yeah. One of those. That's incredible. Yeah, well, I, don't th I knew people had gone to the islands to do that, but it's just nobody had actually stuck to the coast. I don't know what it was. I think Wales was, was just the best place to start because Wales is the only country in the UK that has a coast path from beginning to end. Um, and I really enjoyed being next to the coastline. So I, I think had I started somewhere else, maybe I wouldn't have been so rigid. But um, 
you know, I knew once I got up into Liverpool, I thought, oh my God, I don't, not, I do love Liverpool, but I don't like these built up areas. <laughs> Sorry, anyone from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the built up areas that I, I just didn't like. So I kind of made a vow to myself, knowing how happy I was when I was on the coastline itself, that that's where I was going to stick. So I had nothing to prove to anybody. I, I didn't even have anything to prove to myself. It's just what I liked. I liked the challenge. And ironically, it was those challenges that helped me to kind of regain my sort of self sense of purpose. Incredible. And in the first few days of this, I mean, you talk about it in the book, but kind of what went through your head on the first, yeah, the first few days you leave Wales, you're walking, you don't have much to your name. What was going through your head at the time? Um, that's, that's a good question. I don't really know. I think, um, you know, I'd had a bit of a heavy night before I left, so probably getting over that was the first thing. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know... For me, it was kind of, I wasn't running away from my problems. I, I think that would be the wrong thing to say. It was more um, pulling yourself out of a situation to be able to press the reset button. So in a way, like the, the further I was getting away from Swansea, the sort of more, I just felt like everyone was, was you know, coming for me. That's the sort of mentality that I had, um, you know, given the fact that I had debt collectors and all these things coming to the door. And, so the further I went away, the more peace of mind. So I really was in a strange mindset at the time, even though I wasn't eating. Um, I didn't have very good gear at well. I didn't have good gear at all. Um, I didn't care. I, I had a purpose, and that's important. That's incredible. And how has it been when you kind of pulled all of this together, writing this book? When you kind of reflected back on it, how how was that for you? Well, Magnus was only three days old when I started oh writing that. <laughs> that's insane. Um, again, look, it's really surreal because what, what I say normal life, you know. Going day by day just didn't work for me. It just, I just feel like I felt like every, everything was so planned and, um, you know, people were looking so far ahead. And, and for me, I just, do you know, I just wanted to finish work and go for a surf or just go and do something cool. And it didn't really involve much money. I, I never had the intention of having four huge houses and all these cars. It just wasn't for me. And, and uh, yeah, just separating myself away from all of that and going into the walk where actually living day by day worked. Um, rather than being frowned upon, if you like. Um, yeah, winner, winner. Yeah. <laughs> and you recorded so much of that via video, is that right? Mm. So when you kind of, did you look back on those videos when you were writing the book at all? Yeah, occasionally. You know, I only did, so the photos and the videos, ironically, I only did because I was, you know, a complete technophobe. I just didn't know what I was doing with all this stuff. So I only took photos um, to prove to people that, that I was doing what I said I'd done. Because I just, in my head, it was very much, if I take a picture of this part of the coast, somebody's going to know. So if anyone ever questions it, it's there. So um, after a while, that became an obsession, obviously. Um, and the videos took a long time. You know, the first video I ever done, I think, was about three days into it. And I was in a, it, I was a mess. You know, looking back now, it was kind of, wow. Um, but, yeah, you know, I just, my confidence grew over time. And, you know, I started really enjoying it. And I think... That the time that I spent on my own, which was a lot of time, um, that it was my only connection between me, me and people. So um, I got, more than anything, I just got excited. It's like, look at this, my God, you know. So I wanted to show everybody um, what I was seeing. It's interesting about the people connectedness because right at the beginning of the book, you seem really distrustful of people. And then actually, as you go through, so many people, which I think surprises me, to be honest, from the UK, that there were so many people that were so willing to open themselves up to you and kind of offer you support um yeah how was that for you like kind of coming to terms with that and um yeah getting to know all of these different people oh it was amazing you know yeah. so look i would say a good 50 percent of the people that that you know i connected with through my journey that that came to help you know maybe had things going on themselves so you know i, I think that really helped me because i realized that by me being open about it and not being ashamed about the fact that i'd I'd done silly things and I, I'd messed up and, you know, I'd, I'd put myself in these stupid positions time after time. There's no shame in that, you know. We all, we all go through, th through life and have our little hurdles to cross. And, um, you know, so that, what was happening was people saw I was opening up, so they would then come and open up to me. And the next minute I was just finding, wow, you know, I'm having these full-on conversations with somebody that I've never met before. And they're telling me the most intimate details of their life. And... and it's really nice, you know, it's really nice that, that that was happening. And and it really helped me to grow as well, because I realised, bloody hell, you know, you've got, you've got to be honest and open about these kind of things if you're ever going to be able to move on. You know, it's as simple as that. I mean, the bit that really struck me was the story about Michael uh -huh. um, and the fact that you kind of 
um and ah in about whether or not to go and visit this guy, and then you do, and then it turns out that he had an it was a terminal illness, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. He passes away. Yeah, it'd be laughing now because I'm still wearing it. <laughs> um, yeah, so Michael, I, 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 yeah, I wasn't going to go and see him. I was exhausted, and I'd just come from Loch Fine, which is the biggest sea lock in Scotland, and it was a big, arduous trek, I have to say. Um, and I didn't want to go, you know, I really didn't. But yeah, it turned out that the guy was just the loveliest bloke ever, and I've never seen Jet go to anybody like that before. Um, I, I never had, so um, yeah, I was glad I went, and then obviously I found a little note to say that he wasn't well, and yeah, he did die a few months later, so I kept wearing the hat as he asked me to. Um, yeah, still haven't taken off. Kate, I swear down, has never, ever seen my hair. <laughs> I'm trying to bag another child so that she can't leave <laughs> when she does. <laughs> it's all dreadlocks under here. It's a mess. That's, it's amazing, though, that you managed to keep it on. And, yeah, that's a, a big, yeah, that, it was just that story that really struck me that Thank you. I was reading it on the train and I was, like, sobbing. Um, yeah. Um, I guess kind of thinking about the mental health aspect then um, and touching on something you, you've just said previously, this is one of the most honest books that I've read in a really long time, especially an adventure book. Um, so ha when you were writing it, how important was it, do you think, to kind of pull through those mental health, health aspects? Like, as you said, you talked more with the people that you met over the time on your journey. And, yeah, how, how important was that to kind of bring that to the forefront in your book? Um, at the end of the day, look, I said to my publisher when they offered me this, I, I, again, I really can't believe how this has all just happened. You know, they came to me. I'd never considered writing a book. It just wasn't in my vision, if you like. And... Um, yeah, I, I just said to them, look, I, I want to write this how I want to write it. And, you know, I don't, I, I'm not in this for money or anything like this. I simply, if I'm going to do something, I just want to see if what I write works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. I'll know that I'm just not a writer. So I think it, you can't have a story like that without the story. And I think the big part of the story was the reason that I started it. So, um, you know, I, I was, I can't begin to tell you how shameful I felt years building up to this about the position I was in. But now I, I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of it because at the end of the day, I wouldn't be sat here now had it not been for those issues. So I wouldn't change a thing. Um, you know, the biggest thing for me for writing that was the fact that I was getting to revisit and really actually think, even though I had to do it in a very short space of time, actually think about some things that perhaps I'd never thought about before. And, um, you know, I beat myself up a little bit. I know that much, but either way... Um, yeah, it was really good to be writing it all down and, and just, I didn't think about it at all. I just, what came into my head went onto the paper. I did it literally on a pen and a paper, none of this laptop malarkey because I can't use them. Um, so, yeah, it just came out completely naturally and um, I still haven't read it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. Did you, I'm sure when we spoke before this, you said that um, it only took you a couple of weeks, right? Is that yeah. right? Just to bring it all out? Yeah, all, all together, about a couple of weeks. The last book I've just done, even, I spend more of my time thinking than I do writing when it comes, comes to books. You know, I'll often just say to Kate, look, Kate, I'm going to go out in the van for, you know, a day or two and just, and I just think about the stuff that I want to write about. And then once I've noted that down, then I, it all just comes out then. So, yeah, the majority of my book writing is thinking and then the rest of it is... Um, is the writing, which I, is weirdly enough the easy part for me. I, I noticed with Kate, it's like Kate's writing a book at the moment, and she'll be sat there in front of the laptop and, and pondering on what to say and stuff like this. Oh, do you reckon this? And I was like, mate, just get it down on paper, you know, see what happens afterwards. And um, yeah, I think for me personally, that works. That's a great Apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that annoys quite a lot of authors. <laughs> just winging it once again. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that comes across in your story that that is exactly how you kind of did your coastline trip, and yeah. I mean, so, oh, sorry, my throat is gone. Um, how has your kind of, as you said, you sort of reflecting on different elements of yourself as you were writing this, how has your kind of perspective of yourself changed over time? Um, you kind of touched on it there by saying, you know, you were once really ashamed and you're now quite proud of it, of yourself. But yeah, how has your pers perception of yourself changed? Um, I don't think it's changed okay. at all. I, I, Maybe an element of frustration of why the hell didn't I do something like this before? You know, what, what, look, I, if anything I've taken away from that book um, and writing it was the fact that I listened to too many people. Yeah. Um, you know, I was always coming out with these extravagant, extravagant ideas, you know, all the way through my life. And 
you know, the look on, even when I was unhappy, you know, oh, you know, if you're unhappy, go and get a better job, or why didn't you try moving somewhere else? So, you know, no, you know, it's not, it's not what it's all about for me. So if I've learned anything, it is really, really, really just to not so much follow this, but this, and, and um, I, for the first time in my life that I ever decided to follow my heart instead of my head, um, this happened. So maybe this could have happened a long time ago, but then I would never be as grateful because um, I think the reason I'm so happy now is because I know what it feels like to be unhappy. So um, it's a good place to be. Yeah, that's a really nice, nice thing to say. Um, and when you were kind of going along this route, I know that you said that you kind of winged a lot of it, but was there ever a sense at any point that you were like, I can't do this, I can't keep going? Or was it always, you know, I'm going to keep going, moving forward? What? Yeah, no, it, so I, n I never really could handle my heart to say that I ever thought that. So it was the way it progressed and the way it worked is, you know, I, I left as a guy that was just about to be homeless with absolutely nothing. I, re I really had nothing, no self-esteem. I mean that on a personal level as well. So um, once I, you know, had been donated a few better things, you know, and my, my gear was a little bit better, um, and when it came to the camping side of things and the things that I really needed, so the camping, the being good at understanding weather systems, you know, how to just being good at pitching tents and knowing where to do it, working out just everything, fires, all this sort of stuff, foraging. I realized that, you know, there's something that I'm really good at. You know, people, when I was going to the Outer Hebrides, for example, and it, it just so happened there was no plan that I, I was going there for winter in Shetland. The amount of people that were saying to me, mate, you're, you're absolutely stupid. You know, nobody's ever camped, you know, through a winter in, in these places before. And, you know, you don't have to go to the Himalayas or, or other places to, to have really bad weather. I can promise you, <laughs> if, if anyone goes to Shetland, you know, they've had like 230 odd mile an hour winds up there, um, which is ridiculous. So to, to know you're going into those places with a little bit of canvas is a frightening thought. But at the same time, I had complete faith in myself. Um, I really, really did. By these points, I had so much confidence, um, not arrogantly, because you, you can't be arrogant, because one mistake and that's it, it's game over. But um, yeah, I, I was good. Living outside all of the time is very, very different to going hiking for a few weeks. You know, you, you, your body really does adapt to it. I wouldn't say I was never cold, that would be a complete lie, but um, I certainly got used to it. Yeah. You know, I really, really did. I remember it being in Shetland, and it was New Year's Eve, and it was horrific hail. It really, really was. And um, I was walking past these houses annoyingly, smelling all of these like lovely roast dinner things being cooked. <coughs> and there was an old Viking house that had been rebuilt. And I never forget it. I walked through the door and out of the wind. Um, and I basically started wearing a T-shirt once I was out of the wind. And this was in like zero temperatures. And wow. it just goes to show you that what the human body is capable of doing. And I was obsessed with that kind of stuff. You know, I used to write it all down in my journal how I felt that day. And you know, my fingers are numb, but I can still do stuff. It's really crazy. That's insane, like, that you were able to kind of adapt in such a way. And, and also in quite a short space of time, really. Mm. I mean... I'm going to make six years as a beast. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, actually touching on the kind of foraging and things like that, you learned so many things. And that was just all through kind of, I assume, just trial and error and kind of just working it out yourself. Is that right? I mean, yeah, things like forage and not so much trial and error because the <laughs> errors can be disastrous. Um, yeah, I, I did learn that once. But no, no, I, <coughs> yeah, of course, you know, I, the only way that you can do, certainly with a dog, um, the only way that you can do the barren, barren parts of the UK, and, and there are some, um, is because I had to carry so much food for Jet, was for me to forage. Um, it was the only way I could do it. And also, I had no money, you know, going through these parts. So, um, what little money that I was, you know, people were amazing. They'd hand me a tenner every now and then and just say, you know, that's for you, not the charity. And I'd always stock up on dog food for Jet. I'd always stock up on some carrots and a bit of stock. Um, and then I could just forage away and make stews out of pretty much anything I wanted, depending on what time of year. But I just really enjoyed doing it. I never put that out on social media and that I was doing that because I didn't feel confident enough that um, what I was doing was something that I should be teaching yet, you know, because... Yeah, you don't want to teach someone to eat something, and then next minute they're in hospital. So, uh, yeah, I kind of kept that one back to myself, but definitely on the next adventure, that's going to be something that I'm going to be really into. Oh, that's incredible. And were there any kind of, was there any moment at all that you kind of felt, I mean, you, you talk about some of the dire straits that you get yourself into, the kind of diarrhea position. Oh, brilliant. That was great. <laughs> really great bit of the story. Um, yeah, was there any moment where you were like, oh, you know, I'm in real shit now. I don't know how to. <laughs> 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 I 
other than that one. The models didn't know that, did they? Uh, <laughs> <No>. um, <coughs> I, I look, Shetland was the first place that scared me. It was. Um, some of the winds out there, that, when they come, come from nowhere, there were times when, you know, we weren't, I wouldn't say in the middle of the nowhere, but a good, like, four or five miles before, across really peaty, sort of marshy terrain to, to get to anywhere, really. So far enough that if something was to go wrong, then it's going to be an effort to get back. But look, I think Jet was such a huge part of this walk for me and a part of my life that she was a, a, a focus away from a lot of it, if that makes sense. So I just wanted to keep an eye on her. And there were times when, you know, the winds came in and I physically couldn't stand up. Um, they just come from nowhere. So we would just have to lie behind a, a boulder or something with Jet, me laying on the floor, protecting Jet's body from the wind, just thinking, please don't last too long because... Um, you know, we get hypothermic, as simple as that. So they, those were, were pretty scary. It's very, very different doing um, an expedition or an adventure on your own. You know, most people would go mountain climbing or mountaineering or doing these kind of things as a group or with people. So you've got that safety net. If something goes wrong, you know, if a simple thing like falling and whacking your head, knocking yourself out, somebody else is on the blower, you know, we, we need someone help. So subconsciously that was always in my mind um, and we had some big stretches where it really was don't break a leg here and um, or don't fall over here and I think it was Jet that kept me from being stupid because more so for her sake than mine I was very very careful when I was doing it if, if something was really sketchy I'd rather take two days doing it than, than, than rush through it and risk injuring myself and you know she's, she's left in the lurch. I mean, I mean she herself like really developed herself as a really resilient dog. I mean, I don't know how many my... Oh, she's like a mountain goat in her prime, yeah. this one. I just compare... I mean, my childhood dogs, I remember, wouldn't even go out in snow. So, you know, and, like, you know, the light dusting that we get, they'd just be like, no. We're yeah, not going yeah. Now. So the fact that she managed to kind of do all of this has... Just out of interest... I don't think she had a choice. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what is she going to do? go with someone else. Yeah. <laughs> I really like this guy, but come on, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how has it been since kind of coming back? I mean, you've only been back fairly recently, to be fair. Yeah. How has she adapted? Well, you know, I, I retired Jet a little while ago. I, I've always said, so we got a van after um, Magnus was born. And this is no joke, and I've openly admitted this to Kate, that I would say 80% of the reason for getting the van was actually not for Magnus, but, but for Jet. Because... Um, I knew we were going through the summers down the south of England. It was really, really hot. So I knew that she wasn't going to cope with this. She was definitely getting older. After she had a big operation from cancer, um, something changed in her. And I knew, right, mate, you know, you've done your bit. So I kind of retired her then, to be honest with you. And now she just loves doing absolutely nothing, she, <laughs> as you can see. Um, she loves doing nothing. She's amazing with Magnus. You know, the poor thing in her retirement is now getting tortured by a toddler. Um, <laughs> But yeah, she's got a good little life, you know, and I take her out where I can, and um, she can just walk when she wants now, rather Aww. than having to. Yeah, bless her. And was, when you kind of got her, was there a part of you that was kind of worried about the responsibility, or was it at that point you were kind of like, I really wanted the company? And Oh, I was terribly worried, you know. Yeah. I, I have to say, the first night I was stroking her in the tent, and um, it was when we had that beast from the east, so it was really cold, and... Uh, yeah, I was really, really thinking to myself, you know, is this just a really stupid idea? But, you know, the turning point for me was the, the day after when um, I got up in the morning and she'd only known me for an evening and that bit of love that she had received in the tent, she, um, something had happened to her, I think, you know, towards me. And I got up in the morning, I got out of the tent and I just walked and then she came and then I just ran a little bit and she came. So just overnight, literally... <laughs> There was an immediate thing between her and I, and, and, and just that little look in her eye, you know, something just said, yeah, okay, this is a good choice. And it was the best decision I ever made. I always say, you know, Kate always asked me, how do you describe, you know, a dog's loyalty? And I said, well, if I lock you and her in the boot of a car, I guarantee you she'll be the one that comes to see me, jumps up to see me when I open it. <laughs> Yet to try it. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I mean, what kind of what happened after the book ended? Because I'm quite conscious that actually this, the book kind of ends sort of almost halfway through mm -hmm. your journey. Um, as I say, you only really finished like a few months later. So we actually don't see, um, you hit your target yeah. for donations. Um, and yeah, we don't, we kind of don't really see 
that part of it. So yeah, what happened after and what sort of, yeah. I'll tell you that, mate. That'll ruin the second book, won't it? <laughs> um, no, so look, I, it's all about chances. This is what I love about taking chances, I suppose. I said to my publisher, look, there is no way in this world that I can fit this journey into 90,000 words. It'll water it down too much, um, and I just, I'm just i not prepared to write it if, if that's the case. So um, me and my editor said, look, let, let's stop it in Hildesay before I meet Kate. Mm -hmm. um, and if the book does okay, then we'll get commissioned for a second book then. So yeah, I think that's the way to do it. I'd rather have half a story um, out there that, than a whole story that's you know not told well at all. So um, that's exactly what we've done. So yeah, the next one just picks up from where this, this left off. And ironically, after Hilda say only about a month later, I meet Kate and then it was all pretty crap from there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only saying that because she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be in the crowd like that. Um, since it's come out, what has been the reception to the book? I mean, how are, are there people that are kind of wanting to emulate you? Or th what's kind of happened with people's adventures? Look, <coughs> I, it was, I really mean it. I joke about it, but this is all so blurry to me. It's just, I find it's funny, um, the whole thing. You know, I really do mean it. I just went for a walk. And so for all this to happen... Um, you know, even, even with the book thing, you know, the fact that I'm sat down here talking about my own book, and I've done some big festivals recently, like a lot of people, and I was sat next to Raina Wynn, and we were doing a talk, and I'm just thinking, I really don't belong here. <laughs> you know, she's written all these awesome books. So, yeah, I just look, at the end of the day, um, I, I just, if anyone even reads that from that book, for what I, 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 from starting the journey to even actually writing the book, just go for it. What have you got to lose, that, you know? And I think that's maybe, I'm starting to understand a little bit, that's why maybe people are attracted to it. Um, the whole story and everything like this, just, just just grab life by the horns and go for it. Don't sit there and fester, simple as. Um, see what happens. It's a great method. And um, kind of talking about um, people kind of wanting to do similar things, have you found that um, people are trying to kind of emulate some of the... The, the coastal walk? Yeah, it's like the M25 now. <laughs> it really is. There's so many walkers out there, I can't keep up with it. <laughs> Look, at the end of the day, if, if people have seen somebody doing that, you know, if I, before I started this, I never knew anybody had walked mainland Britain or anything like this before, so, um, you know, and if I was in a bad place and it had worked for somebody else, then yeah, absolutely, you know, maybe, maybe I should go and do this, so good, you know, happy days if people have gone out there and they're doing something and it's, and it's helping them, then that's, that's wonderful. That in itself was worth the walk. Um, let alone all of the other stuff. So, um, yeah, it just goes to show that if you follow your dream in your heart, then you can go for it. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, it wasn't a dream. I don't even particularly like walking. <laughs> I just like, I like the stuff you see when you do it. Um, you know, I'm more of an adrenaline junkie in that respect. But, um, yeah, I, I'm glad that it's, it's, you know, catapulted other people to go and do what they want to do as well. That's a good place to be. Very good place to be. Um, sort of a, sort of, what's the word? The word's gone. Um, there's a bit of a mirror in the book where we kind of see you right at the beginning and you, you're in this kind of hole, as you mentioned at the, at the start of this conversation. And then, you know, you have this kind of isolation that comes from kind of being in society and then you are out on your own a lot of the time for weeks and yeah. weeks of time where you don't speak to anybody. What was the kind of difference in those two periods of isolation, do you think? Was there, yeah, what was so different about the two? Well, from when I first started the walk, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, well, the first isolation that I was in, I wasn't in a good place, you know, um, I, I, everything was negative, you know, I, I felt like, you know, I, I um, yeah, like I said, I, I just got my sit stupid now I look back, but, you know, someone would be knocking on my door and I was like, oh my God, it's a Russian spy, and it was like really weird how the, the mindset that I'd got myself into, but the difference between the isolation there and being on this walk was the fact that I was in a good headspace, you know, I never ever sat there, like, for example, the lockdowns, um, never once when we went to lockdown did I think to myself, oh my God, we've got to sit still for three and a half months. It was right, three and a half months to do, to, you know, do something and learn more and not be in work or, yes, please, let's, let's do this. So I just wrote a little list of things I wanted to get better at. I wanted to get better at foraging. I wanted to get fitter. Um, and yeah, just other things like that. So I just kept myself occupied all the time. Um, she was, Jet was great for that. You know, she was really good because I always could just um, play around with her when I wanted to. But otherwise, you know, I just kept myself occupied and I knew I was in a good headspace when, when I was bored, it was like, right, okay, what should I do? Rather than, oh no, you know, thinking oh, this is gonna happen or what if or what if. And 
So, yeah, but that's one of the beauties about living for the day. You know, when we said about going over to Hildesley, there wasn't a single thought in my mind of, um, you know, I'm going to an uninhabited island. How, how am I going to eat or how are we going to do this? All the hows and what ifs, you just need to abolish those and, and cross those bridges when you come to them. So just, just take the plunge and, and, you know, work it out when you're there. And how, how long were you on the island for in the end? I don't know. Was it, was it three, three, three yeah. months, the first lockdown? Yeah, yeah, I think it was three months. Which isn't a, a long period of time, but, um, you know, I think the thing was that I didn't have much battery power or anything like this, so, you know, there was no real contact with anybody. I would still do social media posts, but I was doing so much, ironically, so much press stuff over there. They were flying drones over from the mainland, over to the island. There's, like in the documentary, you could see me waving like a complete <laughs> nonce. Um, and they just, yeah, they were flying drones over and stuff, so it, it was just crazy what had all happened, and I... Um, yeah, I just kept throwing tennis balls against walls, and every time I dropped it, I had to do press-ups or sit-ups or something. <laughs> Jackie Chan would have been proud of me. <laughs> um, I've seen in kind of subsequent interviews where you talk about the interest in kind of um, pushing your limits and trying to find that, and I think that's like a, that's a really common theme that comes up in a lot of kind of more adventurous books. I don't get the sense in here that that's kind of what you were doing, but yeah, how have you? Yeah, what, what were your thoughts around that, about pushing your limits and trying to find your... I mean, l listen, I think I was doing it all the time. I, I really didn't want to make the book about, um, you know, look at me, I'm really tough and hard and, you know, I'm living out in snow and I'm pushing my limits, you know. Um, I, I really didn't want to make it about that because, um, you know, I, I think there's other things that I was pushing my limits for, you know. So, um, look, at the end of the day, it, it, um, every single day I was doing something that was completely different to the norm. Um, the winters made me push my limits. The summers were worse than winters by far, especially with the midges in Scotland. Um, so every season, autumn and spring were by far the best seasons for, for adventures like this, where I felt like I could take a bit of a breather because it was too hot for jet in the summer. The water from the mountains dries up so quickly. And so you find yourself out of water and all this sort of stuff. So they all had the challenges. Every day it was pushing a limit, if you like, and, but just in different ways. But, yeah, I just saw them as challenges, you know, let's see what happens. The midges in particular sounded absolutely... Worst ever. I mean, what, what's that all about? Just <laughs> it's not funny. Like, they're really not. It's, it's, all these people just, oh, yeah, you smidge and have a fire. Yeah, no worries. I'll just put a fire up quickly, you know, to get rid of the midges. <laughs> but for us, it was torture. That, you know, going into a place knowing that you can go and jump in your camper van or you're going back home that evening, you, you, you can deal with them. You can put smidge on your face, but... We were walking and it was hot, so the smidge was just running down into my eyes. I couldn't see. Um, it was poisonous in the tent. Um, I couldn't cook food outside. Basically, through that, throughout the summer, I would spend... Have you ever seen that film, I Am, Le I Am Legend, where the shade comes in and he's just, like standing there waiting for the shades? That's what it's like. Oh, my God, the shades come in, the midges are there. <laughs> and literally, we would just be annihilated. So every night, pretty much, where there wasn't a bit of wind or rain, um, we would be in that tent just sweating and sweltering and... Um, it didn't get dark till God knows what time at night. I couldn't eat food outside. You're looking at these amazing views, um, but the wait, midge is just there waiting to, <laughs> to annihilate you. And then Jet would go out for a wee. So my night consisted of Jet going out for a wee, coming back in, me laying on my side, one by one, killing off a thousand midges. By the time I'd done it, she'd want to go out again. Oh, my God. She was like, oh, you've got to be joking. Come on, Winter, come on. <laughs> was it just day after day with this? Oh, it was relentless, yeah. It wow. was genuinely relentless. Um, it, mentally, it was the toughest part of my walk, without Even a doubt. So than the winters? A hundred percent, yeah, a hundred percent. Winters, look, winters are great. All you need to do is know how to keep warm. Yeah. Um, it's like, once you're cold and wet, you're cold and wet, you know, that you can't get away from that, and that's like the midges. Um, yeah, it was far, far worse. And in the day, daytime, the clegs would come out, or the horse flies, they oh, call them. So you're just getting chewed to death. It's just a massive McDonald's walking around for insects, <laughs> basically. <coughs> and did they also go after Jet as well? Uh, she, well, she's got hair, but they did go after her eyes. Oh, yeah, they yeah. did. It, it was relentless. It really, really was. And I looked them up. I tried to forgive them, but it turns out bats eat them. Um, but if they were to go, nothing would be affected. <laughs> so they're just useless pests, basically. <laughs> A bit like my, what Kate calls me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, you managed to stay in some really incredible places, like yeah. both historically and also like geographically, really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. What do you think were some of the favourite parts? That, I mean, if you can say some of your favourite parts. I think one of my favourite. It wasn't just the place that I was. You know, we stayed in, but I wrote about it in there. Was a section between Harris and Lewis. It was a huge section, and we had we'd had um, some really um, awesome weather. It was you know massive blizzards coming into us and stuff and. Um, we found this old house that a hermit used to live in, and, and it still had newspapers uh, clippings all along the walls. Like, I was trying to work out a crossword from 1904 or something like this. Um, I can't even do crosswords today, so I don't know why I tried. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just fascinating, and, and more so to just get a perspective on how other people lived, uh, and you know, back in the day, if you like. And a lot of the places that I camped, I realised that I was getting very, very sort of like acute to understanding good places to go. You know, I'd, I'd be able to see down the coast knowing that I'd be going in and out all of these outlets up and down gullies and valleys and choosing spots. And pretty much, certainly on the west coast in the islands where I chose a spot, um, for whatever reason, um, there, there was an old settlement there. You know, it's, it's amazing how it all works. Yeah, I really had become obsessed with it, I have to say. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I loved everywhere. The only thing I didn't like was the, the big cities and built up areas that I found them really, really hard to, to go to sleep in. Um, because I just like to be in, a, in the middle of nowhere, really. And was there a noticeable difference in terms of kind of how much support you found in the kind of bigger cities and then in comparison to...? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Listen, I've always said you can't be more isolated than being in a big city. Um, you can't because people are just too busy with their own lives. So ironic, my, you know, my brother lived in London all of his adult life and um, hardly even knew any of his neighbours in places that he lived, whereas... I go to Scotland. I've been up in Scotland now for three months. And everywhere I go, it's like, hi, Chris, hi, Chris, how's it going? So, um, yeah, I think that's probably the reason why I, I tried. To, I just went through the cities, you know, so boom. But I know how important to PR it was for the charity. So, um, yeah, I just got through them all. Yeah. And speaking of Scotland, actually, it's really clear that this is a really special place to you. Yeah. What, was, it, was it always a special place or was it kind of just spending that time? <laughs> She's getting old and she likes a wee in precarious places nowadays. Jack, come lay down. Oh no. We did it, I, I kid you not, we did a talk the other night um, in front of people. And don't worry, she went, by the way, to the people. And we did a talk and I had Magnus in one hand whilst Kate was talking, Jack doing a wee. Then Magnus thought it was a puddle, so he was jumping in the puddle <laughs> in front of all these people. I was just like, oh God. Yeah. Take me back to the head, British, quick. Come here, girl, lay down. Sorry. No, don't track, worry. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah, so, yeah, Scotland and how it kind of came to mean so much to you. Yeah. Um, I, I think, look, it was the only, it's the only place in the UK where you can disappear. You know, look, I hate to say it, the south of England isn't barren. It's not wild. You know, you've always got... You're all, I think the biggest distance was about eight miles okay. of, of, from one small town to another, if, you, if that makes sense, whereas you can disappear for days on end up there, and that, that's exactly what I needed, and that's why I think it was so special. It was only when I started to get my teeth into the islands and you know, really started to put my adventure head on that, that um, I stopped thinking about everything else. You know, it was very much, you know, get up in the morning, pack your gear away, make sure you've checked pretty much where you need to be going for the day, where potential spots are for eating. So it just, it totally brought me back to, the, to what human beings actually need. Yeah. And that is food, water and shelter. End of, you know, anything else is a luxury. And I think, you know, we forget that. Um, and I think that's, blimey, <laughs> don't worry, kids are animals. Um, I think it was that, that that turned my life around. So um, Scotland was the only place here in the UK that I could do that, where I could just go to an island and say, right, I'm not going to see anybody now for four days. Um, I, I really do remember coming back to, uh, it's like even to a little hamlet or a village and seeing sheep and just thinking to myself, Jet, sheep, we're near humans. You know, it's, it's crazy, really, thinking about it. But um, yeah, it was definitely, I think, that and they're just so friendly up there. Mm -hmm. Um, the more north you go, I think people just become friendlier and friendlier. I really believe that. I'm, I'm sorry to any, you know, <laughs> people down south. But I just, that's how I found it. You know, I noticed a remarkable difference from being very, very north to what I did being very, very south. And um, people are just more approachable. Um, I think less busy, if you like. And, uh, you know, just have a bit more time to stop and talk to you. And I like that. You know, I really, really loved that. I think for me, it just, I felt like there was a place after this walk. This was even before I met Kate that... You know, whatever I decide to do next, there's a place for me to be. Yeah. Certainly the islands. Yeah. The, the more outer you go, 
the more sort of like everyone just stops and talks to you. It's lush. Yeah. And would you change anything about the trip that you did if you could go back, or are you just you're happy with how you how it turned out? I mean, I, I could. I, yeah. I mean, listen, I never expected it to go the way that it did. I couldn't change anything. No, no, um, no, absolutely not. If anything, I could change. It would just be that I could make her five years younger again. But other than that, um, I mean, listen, I, I set out just to cross a line and be happy. And I came back with a family, a dog, a sense of purpose, um, and just feeling happy to wake up every morning. You know, what a lovely position to be in, me and Kate are in. We don't own anything. We have nothing. We have very little money. Um, but the world is our oyster. It's, it's, it's things that tie us down. Um, so we're in a great position. Um, yeah, very, very happy. Brilliant. And I guess one of my few final questions are about actually the title of the book, Finding Hilda Say. What, how did you come up with that title and sort of what does that mean to you? I, that was on the last night of, of being on Hilda Say, that was. I remember thinking, you know, the obvious one is finding happiness, isn't it? Because um, that's what I set out to do. And because uh, I was on Hilda Say, and I think, you know, I was so worried when I went on that boat over that, that being busy on the walk was just a plaster. You know, once I stop again, you know, maybe those, you know, not so good thoughts are going to start peering back into my mind. And, and um, yeah, that would have just overshadowed everything on all the hard work that I'd put in. But absolutely never once did that happen. And I realized how happy I was there. So, yeah, it's basically finding happiness. And that's where I found it. So, yeah, I, I said to the publisher, literally the first time I ever spoke to them, is I'm calling this book Finding Hill to Say, otherwise I'm not doing it. And they're like, OK. <laughs> And what sort of plans have you got now going forward? And what, I guess my other question is, what does adventure mean to you? Like, what, what is that now? Um, do you know, for me personally, I, I always remember that first lift that I got down to Tlangeneth Beach. And, you know, I'd been a silly boy the night before. I wasn't in a good place. And somebody had laced my coffee with something, and, <laughs> and I drank it anyway. Um, and I remember just sitting in the back of this car, feeling more like I should be going to hospital rather than starting a six-year expedition. And I was thinking of all these other adventurers, you know, people that I admire, the Shackletons, and, um, and all these guys, and how organized ev everything is. And um, I, for me personally, the whole thing about adventure is the getting away from having to be so organized. There's certain things you have to be organized with, of course you do. But for me, adventure is, is having no idea what's coming next and just embracing the whole thing. Um, that's what this journey has been about for me, and um, it's what I've loved about it so much. You know, I met other walkers that were meticulously planning. You know, are you know putting dates up? I'm going to be. It's like it's August and like November. I'm going to be up in Shetland. And I'm like, shit, I don't even know where I'm going to be tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I don't know who's wrong here, but I think for me it worked. Um, that's why I was able to stick to the coastline. As meticulous I was, I put no pressure on myself, um, which was exactly what I wanted to do. And and. Yeah, for me, adventure is just going out there, working it out as you go, and, and just embracing everything, enjoying it. Amazing. And yeah, what sort of plans have you got for the future? Are you able to talk about them? Well, now that we've just finished the book, um, the second book, we're going to basically go to the Outer Hebrides for Christmas. Go spend. I want to go and see some places that I've really, really missed. Um, and yeah, we're going to discuss it then. We've talked about, a, a, well, a producer's been in touch about a series a 10-part series on revisiting my favourite places around the UK coastline, um, which, you know, we were never in this for popularity or, or any of that stuff, so I'm not sure if that's something that I, I'm going to do, but it's a lovely option to have, isn't it? Um, me and Kate just love showing off amazing places and amazing people um, and adventuring in the process, so whatever it is next is going to be that. <laughs> And how has it been, actually, sorry, I just have one more question. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a personal question, I feel like that. Yeah, yeah. It's not in the script. How has it been with your son, like, introducing him to some of this stuff? Oh, and walking? Yeah. Oh, it's just amazing. I, I think, you know, when, it's funny, when Kate, we found, Kate first got pregnant, um, people, the, the thousands of messages we got, you need to stop now, you know, who, who are you? I've never met you before, but <laughs> firstly, uh, piss off. <laughs> um, you know, you've got to stop now, you know, Kate's pregnant, you need to look after your girl, and I think, look, I think she's old enough to make her decisions, and so, you know, it was amazing to see how many people think you need to conform to, to the way it should be, forgetting that we've only had central heating for 100 years, and, and all this sort of stuff, so we knew in our hearts that we were going to give Magnus the best start in life, 
by having him outside, keeping, away, keeping him away from all of these things that are easy to distract with, whether it be mobile phones, laptops, iPads, all this stuff. You know, Magnus, from, from, the, day, from the word go, we could put him under a tree um, and just leave him there and go for a pint. Um, <laughs> Put him under a tree and, and just he would watch all the leaves and just fascinated. Now he does exactly that. You know, he, we can just put him somewhere and he'll just sit there and just watch it. And um, it's good to be cold. It's, it's healthy. You know, it's, it's good to be out in the weathers and, and all this sort of stuff. You build up an immune system to getting a bit dirty. And, um, you know, Kate's mother used to begrudge me even coming into her house. <laughs> You're not coming in here with that kilt. You look like a mess. I'm like, well, I am, but I've never been ill. You know. <laughs> I don't know what you're worried about, mate. It's still a running argument that we have now. But, yeah, we know that we've given him the best start because he's happy. Um, he's absolutely 100% happy. He's healthy. Um, he eats well. And he appreciates everything. And, and, and um, he appreciates the right things. And we feel no need to distract him with anything um, because we just... We're in a, like I said, we're in a great position where, where we can spend all of our time around him. And at this age, that's all they need. Absolutely. So, and he's going to grow up and have such a wonderful... Oh, I can't wait. He's already so cheeky and um, he's adventurous, you know. He's definitely... I, was, I'm, I think I was one of the first as a, as a child where I had to have a dog lead put around me <laughs> um, as a kid because I would just wander off and, you know, we'd go on a little family holiday or something like this with my grandparents and I would just be gone, you know, hunting for things. And Magnus is exactly that. So, you know, if that's what he wants to do, he's going to fly. Amazing. Okay, brilliant. Um, we're now going to go out to the audience to answer some questions from you, so I hope you've got lots. Um. I've paid people in the crowd <laughs> to make there's nothing worse. No, no one having a question, like, oh, God, just bored them to death. Um, who do you want to go for? Do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say I benefited from you. Um, I've not read your book. I don't do Facebook. I don't watch the news. Good man. I had a, an adventure doing all the trick points in Shetland. Amazing. And as I was going round, everybody said, Oh, yeah, we helped Chris out here in that Viking longhouse that you're speaking of. Yeah, about. yeah. I slept in there. Oh, nice. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Did you get a fire on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got your fire on. Yeah, there's a bit of my tooth in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the, 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 the sort of thing that I'd like to say about that is that um, I'm a bit of a nonconformist also, and it helped me a lot that people were more helpful. Of course. Because I was going in your wake. People wanted to help me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait. So you've changed people a bit. And I think um, when you're talking about that series that you were asked to do, I think it would be quite good to highlight like how people can help homeless people. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think this is... When they first put the idea forward to me, um, I was a bit like, no, no, that's not how it should be. Like, who am I? <laughs> you know, um, but... Yeah, that they are so the more human aspect of, of television, I suppose, showing stuff like that often. Yeah, like you said, people helping, I think, would be a great, great thing to, to show off. There's not enough of it, is there? Um, and there are a lot of amazing people out there, um, but we never hear about them. And that's one of the things that I was so proud of to show off on my journey was how good people are. But um, I just want to say I'm really jealous of your beard. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, there's not many people that I can say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. I think it, it is something we're definitely thinking about. But again, um, we'd only do it if it was on our terms. You know, but we don't want to be famous. We don't want to be known. It's, it's not in our interest. That's not why we're doing it. And I think that's why they like us. So um, yeah, we shall see. But I, I will definitely take those points on, mate. Thank you. And well done, by the way. That's an amazing achievement. Yeah, yeah it was good fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I used to hate my beard, but it grew in me. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> That was a good pun. <laughs> okay, next question. Yes. Um, Paul from Brian. I believe everything you said about Scotland. Um, you found a bottle with a message in it. Did you return the bottle with a message in it um, when you were walking? And what, would it, what, what did he say or what would it have said on the message? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, yeah, well, I found it. Um, I was walking with a guy called Kenny Patterson, and it was his, his dog that found it and brought it over at random. It was terrible, the amount of litter that was on this particular section, but it was because nobody went there, and it had all come over from, from Northern Ireland. And um, Yeah, I, I was a bit dubious about whether to go and do Northern Ireland, if I'm honest with you. A lot of other walkers had all missed it out, and certainly being ex-parachute regiment, you know, we're not exactly um, loved over there. So I didn't know whether to do it or not. But then I just thought, you know what, I'm not letting politics stop me from, from going to do something. And I think it was finding that message in a bottle that 
do you know what, I want to go and take this back to the person. So he, he was only young when he wrote it and it was just um, telling him what all his hobbies were and um, you know his best friends. And it was really sweet, actually. You, know, you could really feel the innocence in the bottle and in, in the message. So, yeah, it was from that moment that I just decided, and I was right near Stran Ra, or uh, Kem Ryan, I think it is now, where you get the ferry. Um, so it was that that edged me to go over there, and I had somebody who had been in touch with me asking if I was going from the mirror. And I said, well, look, I'll come over, but I need to find this person. And, um, yeah, f through them we ended up finding him, and we went to take it back, and, you know, the guy's made himself an amazing career now. And, you know, he cried. He was just, wow. Um, I told him off for littering. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, I went and did Northern Ireland straight after that. So I think had I not, had I not found that, I probably wouldn't have gone. So I'm glad that, that we did. Um, yeah, it was a lovely moment, to be honest. Really nice. He gave me a bottle of champers for it, which I've still got. Um, so yeah, thank you. Nice question. Any more questions? Uh, yes, over there. Hi. Hi. I read the book and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, look, I think nothing's changed apart from the fact that I, I was able to give her just so much more of my time. You know, my head's free now, and I just feel like I can be a dad, if that makes sense. So now she just phones me whenever she wants something, or not wants something, but, you know, she just wants to chat, or whereas I sadly um, and shamefully was, was too preoccupied with my own stuff, you know, selfish as that was, um, I'm not going to beat myself up, because these things happen, you know, especially when you're a single parent, but, um, yeah, we've got a wonderful relationship now, and, you know, she wants to come to the Outer Hebrides for Christmas with us, and, um, yeah, it couldn't be better, you know, she's really, really proud, and, you know, Caitlin, if she wouldn't mind me saying this, has had her own, you know, little issues and stuff like this, and seeing me do what I've done, perhaps, you know, was... A, best thing I could have done for, for her because she was the reason that I, I wanted to start this to, to say you know look you can you can achieve anything and I'm doing this for you you know so um yeah everything's great in that respect yeah uh, my pleasure thank you nice question yes um a bit of a niche question but I'm interested in how you define the coast because for instance they're creating an English coastal path at the moment but actually you take trains Oh wow! A spot. So really? Did you walk up every river and estuary, and was yeah. there any a point where you were like, "This is too far inland. I can see the other side of the estuary." Let's just That's a really there. good question. So yeah, I mean, I think every estuary, I just thought, "Ugh," because they're always marshy, <laughs> and there's always a big city at the end of them or a big town. No, we. I really, I mean, I didn't know about that. This whole train thing. I stuck to the coast, literally as f humanly, physically possible. The only things, ironically, that stopped me was army places, um, firing ranges, um, power stations, and private land. You know, they were the only three things that would stop me from walking. And I did try, believe me, I got kicked off of a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, other than that, you know, I think the re one of the other reasons I, I, I loved Scotland so much was because of obviously the law up there is completely different in England. So, um, you know, you had the freedom. Uh, what I found down south and going through England, which was really difficult for people like us, especially now that we have Magnus, was when you're tired at the end of the day and you've, you know, you've been carrying all your gear and you, you, you just want to nestle down and pitch up, we would then end up spending hours trying to find somewhere that we could sneak into to be able to, to go to sleep. And then we were finding that we were having food much later. And then we were waking up late because we were tired because we were just that constant process. Whereas Scotland... Um, again, one of the reasons I loved foraging so much was because I just, this was never ever about I need to get from here to here today. It was all about listening to the body and that's the reason that I made it um, in one piece and well. Because if I felt anything, if there was an, any kind of niggle or if I realised that I was getting slightly clumsy, you know, like tripping over or something, stop, just, just stop for the day. So doing the coast, doing it that way enabled me to stick to the coast like nobody's ever done before um, and it was all down to the foraging side of things if I'm honest so yeah we did every estuary every lock um, every island so circumnavigated it and, and that's one of the reasons it took so long because people don't realize once you start getting you know further up into Scotland and certainly the islands it's not like the, the southwest coast path there are no paths um, you're forging your own way through and um, you'll get a path perhaps that goes from a small town that goes out a mile and then it ends and it's just wild um, but that, that was what floated my boat, to be honest with you. That's what I loved. You know, it would take me a day sometimes just to do a mile. 
um, just from going down into big ravines and intricately working through them and all these big fallen down trees. And um, it was hard, hard work. But oh, at the end of the day, I just felt so good. And um, like I said before, I never had to prove anything to anybody or even myself. I just enjoyed it. You know, it's the bits that scared me that I loved, if that makes sense. I hope that answered that. OK. Any more questions from anybody? Um, oh, we got one over here. Go on, then, yeah. That's a really good question, that is. Um, I think because it happened so slowly, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a One Direction style, suddenly I was on television and boom, <laughs> you know, next minute I'm taking drugs and everything. It, it was very, um, it was a slow progress, uh, process. And look, at the end of the day, I, I do find it strange. Uh, why does any people want to come and talk to me? I, I do find it strange. I think it's very different when you're the one who's doing it. But I think it's very easy to remind ourselves, you know, that for me, it's the, the millionth time someone's come up to me and asked me how many pairs of boots I've gone through. But for them, it's the first. So, and listen, what a lovely place to be in life where people are coming up to you in shops and on the streets and, and shaking your hand and saying, well done, and just being nice, you know. Um, I like that side of it. I really, really do. It's just, I suppose, I think towards the end of the walk, when we were really tiring, we were really sort of um, needing our own space and... You know, some people can be very, very intense. And it's you're 10 o'clock at night and you haven't even made food and there's a queue of 10 people outside the tent waiting to answer questions. It's just like, come on, guys. Um, but, you know, I know all I have to do is shave my beard off and take my hat off. No one will ever know. <laughs> That's it. Done, isn't it? I, I've got an escape clause. So it's like a little safety net. But... Um, no, I, look, I do find it difficult sometimes, especially when I'm doing something that's personal. But at the same time, um, I really, really appreciate the fact that people want to come up and be nice. So, you know, I'd rather that than be horrible. <laughs> so, but good question. Dealing with it. I'm no, I'm no Brad Pitt, but I'm dealing with it. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, if anyone's got one. Uh, is there somebody at the back? Sorry, the lights are in my... Yes, go hey, on. Everybody. Yeah, it spun me out having to see on my left all the time, I must say. Um, look, I, I, yeah, the body does adapt. You know, we're, we're incredibly resilient, and, and I think a lot of people have forgotten that. You know, I think I would say it took me about a year and a half um, when I started going. I, I always talk about the Hebrides in Shetland, but there's a reason for it, because it was brutal out there. It, was just, it wasn't even the fact that the weather was brutal. It was the fact that it was relentless. So every morning was waking up like, oh, my God, it's freezing today. It's hailing again. Um, I really didn't want to get out of the tent, but I knew I had to. I, I knew that once I got out and I'd put my clothes on and started moving, it worked. So it was only ever really the mornings and the evenings where I noticed how how cold it was um, and stuff like this. But yeah, you know, I, I just I just knew that if somebody had taken me out of the flat that I'd used to live in, put me into Shetland in the middle of winter, that. I'd, I'd be gone within a day. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it. But the fact of the matter is, you know, the blood thickens, doesn't it, during the winter, and you, your hands are numb. You know they're numb, but you just accept it. I know it's, it's just it's normal. It starts to become normal, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, it just... Even now, I'm realising we're staying in a little wooden hut at the moment, and I have to really tell myself, I go outside and we've had the fire on inside, and I go out and I'm like, ooh, it's nippy out here. And I'm just like, mate, what's happening to you? <laughs> you know, what's happening? Um, come on, you need to get back out on another adventure. Um, it's, it's amazing how quickly you get used to, you know, modern day luxuries, if you like. Um, but uh, it, takes, it takes longer to get used to living outside than it does to get used to living back inside, if that makes sense. But um, yeah, it wasn't always a downhill slope. It was <laughs> lots of this and <laughs> left, 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 and ups and ups and downs. But um, I was fit. I didn't realise how fit I was until people, you know, asked to come with me. I had one guy in particular, um, special forces, fit as they could be. He'd 
tried this particular section of coast quite a few times and um, and hadn't done it. And I did it in the winter and he asked to come along and, and we did it together and we, we nailed it first time. And um, I think that was because I had become so, it's not just the actual walking side of it, it's understanding the terrain, understanding the land, understanding what you're standing on, looking down, thinking, okay, this section's going to be like that, so maybe if I just divert around this side of it, you know, you're not suddenly up to your knees in peat and mud and all this sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a real art. I really believe that. It's a, it's a real art. And, um, yeah, I need to get back out there, otherwise I'm going to start turning soft again, to be honest with you. <laughs> That's all that we have time for, so um, if you would just join me in thanking Christian. Um... Thanks, guys. Thank you so much and um, there's going to be a book signing at the back so if you haven't got it we'd really encourage you to go and get it and enjoy the rest of your festival thank you Thanks.